seems like Donald Trump just can't stop, or perhaps won't. Donald Trump's language on the campaign trail is getting more dangerous all the time. And as we have documented on this show regularly, his supporters take his words to heart. Here's just a small taste of the vitriol that the disgraced ex-president has been spewing lately to his supporters. This is a sick nest of people that needs to be cleaned out immediately. Get them out. Very simply, if you rob a store, you can fully expect to be shot as you are leaving that store. Shot. We pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. Now, as the bulwarks Jill Lawrence puts it, Trump's rallies have become, quote, tutorials in hate, vulgarity, and disrespect. Lawrence dubbed the former president the worst role model in the history of American politics, and his rhetoric offers chilling previews of what dangers could lie ahead in a second Trump term. In a recent interview with Univision, the former president suggested that should he win a second term, he would use the FBI and the Justice Department to go after his opponents, saying in part, quote, if I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, go down and indict them. They'd be out of business. They'd be out of the election. Now, there's always or also that bombshell Washington Post reporting from earlier this month uh, all about Trump's threat to invoke the Insurrection Act on day one of his second term, which would allow him to deploy the military against civil demonstrations. Autocracy experts have long sounded the alarm over Trump's praise for foreign dictators and his bitter disdain for democratic ideals right here at home. But now they say the former president's increasingly intensive focus on his perceived internal enemies has actually put him even more in line with other dangerous totalitarian leaders. Just take a look here at two people who have had to bear the brunt of Trump's attacks in recent weeks. The New York judge presiding over Trump's civil fraud case and his law clerk. A recent filing detailing what court officials described as a, quote, deluge of threats targeting the pair include hundreds of threatening and harassing voicemail messages. Those messages came directly after Trump repeatedly posted about the judge and the clerk on his failed social media site. And despite this, Trump hasn't slowed down, hasn't rolled back any of his criticisms. In fact, he's only continued them in recent days, doubling down on his insults against the pair and now even going after the judge's wife on social media. Here's how friend of the show and authoritarian expert Ruth ben Giat described Trump's overall strategy, an obvious one of dehumanizing people so that the public will not have as much of an outcry at the things that you want to do. And let's remember, that is the real issue here. The action that could come from Trump's words are real. A recent poll found that 33% of Republicans agree with this following statement. American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save the country. And that is up five points from 2021. Robert Pape, who studies political violence at the University of Chicago, told Roll Call he worries those numbers could forecast danger on the horizon in 2024. Quote, the water looks calm on the surface, but there's turbulence just under the waterline. And anymore, it doesn't take much to set it off. Where we are heading is a tinderbox. Here to discuss this with me is Fernando Amande, Democratic pollster and MSNBC political analyst, uh, Paula Ramos, an Emmy award-winning journalist and MSNBC contributor, and Carol Lamb, a former federal prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst. It's great to have all three of you with us. Uh, Paula, I'll start with you. Um, Trump's rhetoric on the campaign trail getting uglier, uh, more threatening, more vulgar. Has it always been like this, or do you see it now crossing a new threshold? It's always been like this, and it's just getting worse. And I've seen this play out for them. We all have. I've seen this play out on the ground for the last five years. I've seen the way that those words have really fundamentally transformed a segment of the population, radicalized them completely. I mean, the last five years, I've seen pastors that have become Christian nationalists. I've seen men that have turned into anti-trans crusaders. I've seen immigrants turn into border vigilantes. I've talked to many moms that have turned into groups like Monster Liberty. And to Ruth's point, 
it's because these words have the capacity to do something extremely dangerous, which is this ability to dehumanize others. Perhaps, Eamon, the difference is that in 2016, Trumpism was all about dehumanizing immigrants, right? It was about sort of treating immigrants as the enemy for everyone. And now Trumpism is about dehumanizing absolutely everyone that is against him and that is against democracy. And I think that's the fundamental problem that we're up against. And it's, it's, it's understandable that we're at a point where political violence is normalized. If you look at the FBA data, if the, the FBI data, you understand that also hate crimes are on the rise. And again, it's because we're seeing this fusion of the hate with the rhetoric. And the, the question is, what's the next step? We saw January 6th. How much are people willing to go for Donald Trump? And that's a really scary question to pose and to take seriously. Uh, Fernand, I want to get your reaction to what the def former defense secretary, Chuck Hagel, uh, had to say about Trump's recent behavior. He told The New York Times, quote, it is too simplistic to reference him uh, as a neo-fascist or autocrat or whatever. Trump is Trump, and he has no particular philosophy that I've seen after four years as president. Uh, and I'm not really sure how to process that, whether he's downplaying Trump or saying he's singularly unique and that he's being able to encompass all of these threats under his own vision of totalitarianism. That is, uh, as Paolo was suggesting, a form of Trumpism. But what do you make of these comments, and do you agree that Trump is in a league of his own here? Well, first, shame on Chuck Hagel for those normalizing of the abnormal comments. It is exactly that type of poo-pooing of what we are all seeing and hearing and feeling in our guts, in our bones, and between our ears about what is happening. We are in a four-alarm fire moment for American democracy, Amen, because in six weeks, or less than six weeks, voters are going to start voting in these early states if Donald Trump wins Iowa and New Hampshire, and right now the polls show he's going to win both of those states comfortably, no one is really mounting a serious challenge to his standing in those two states. He's going to be the Republican nominee for president. And the difference between a Donald Trump second administration versus the first Trump administration, and this is why Hagel's comments are even more irresponsible and shameful, are because Donald Trump has learned the lessons of what guardrails existed in the first term if he goes in in the second term with this rhetoric that is seed planting fascism, he's planting the seeds now in an environment that he knows he won't be able to enforce. But if, God forbid, he manages to regain power, it will be a different moment. He will then be able to weaponize those words into action. And it is going to be without the guardrails of the first administration, because none of those who stood up and worked within the Trump administration to at least slow that down will be around the next time. We're in a very dangerous moment. That's why words like Hegel's cannot be tolerated. All of us who love this country and this democracy need to call this out for what it is, a fascist movement to end our American democracy led by Donald Trump. Carol, as I mentioned um, a few moments ago, Trump has reportedly threatened to invoke the Insurrection Act against protesters should he retake the White House. And to um, Fernand's point, he's, le he's learned where the guardrails are, so a second Trump presidency will give him a better chance of manipulating them or outright blasting through those guardrails. Um, and that is a good example of it, because that act, which was crafted in our nation's infancy, actually allows the president to call on reserve or active duty military units to respond to unrest in the states. And it's an authority that is not reviewable by the courts. So when we go back to guardrails, are there any guardrails in place to prevent the exploitation of that act from being used if Trump is reelected? Well, as you noted, Eamon, there are not many guardrails. The, the Insurrection Act sort of stands in tension with, or it's an exception to, the Posse Comitatus Act, which says that you can't use federal military forces to uh, deal with civilian unrest. And uh, that that's what most people think. But the Insurrection Act is an exception to that. And uh, there have been calls that this 150-year-old statute really needs to be revisited and it needs to be tightened up because it came to pass it, in a time when our nation was very different. It's not this kind of nation now. And the uh, that Donald Trump has indicated his willingness to see when and how he can use that to put down any unrest that he may cause because of his views about institutions that underlie our democracy. So it is a very, very dangerous situation.